Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to, what did I even technically call this? It's got a long ass name. <laughs> From the Unicorn's Mouth, Stories of Managing Multiple Diverse Identities in Tech. Um, so uh, the, the impetus for this was uh, I, I looked at a lot of uh, the other proposals. Um, and, and it seems like an open source bridges a conference that really uh, values diversity in a lot of different ways. And uh, it seemed like it'd be a really cool place to have a conversation with people about intersectionality and how you deal with uh, having not just one but but multiple minority identities and how that uh, impacts your experience as uh, somebody working in tech um, so that's kind of the idea it's uh, roughly a small panel talk more maybe more of an audience discussion as well i really would love to hear uh, i don't know everybody's experiences because we represent only a very small amount of possible identities that one could have um, and I'd really love to hear from all of you guys as well. Um, but without further ado, uh, we, uh, so I'm Megan Baker. I'm a queer woman uh, working in, in software engineering at a company called Workday. Uh, would you guys like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, so my name is Mioi. Uh, I wasn't on the original list of panelists for this panel discussion. Um, but yeah, I, I'm from San Francisco. I live in Berkeley. I work in a, at a tech company called Meraki in San Francisco. And I've been there for about two and a half years. Prior to that, I was working at a couple different tech companies in Silicon Valley. Um, and yeah, I identify as a queer Asian person, <laughs> uh, gender nonconforming. Hello. My name is Talita. Um, I am a front-end web developer for OkCupid in New York City. Um, I am a pansexual black woman, um, first-generation American. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so kind of to, to get this started, um, uh, I, how can you guys define exactly what uh, intersectionality means to you and, and what it means in your life? Um, so I, I identify with like maybe like three uh, different like marginalized identities, which is like I am, you know, female bodied. Well, actually, maybe that's one. I mean, gender, my gender is not male, basically. Um, I am a person of color slash Asian. Um, and I identify as queer slash lesbian. Um, and, you know, like, to me, it's like, I, like, I don't know, like, I feel like I've been in, like, sort of, like, women who code type um, spaces where it's like, oh, this space is for women. And I don't necessarily feel um, welcome and sort of safe in that space because I'm not just a woman. I am a woman of color. I identify as gender nonconforming slash genderqueer, and so I don't feel like 100% sort of like included in a space like that. So that's what, so like when I, when, when someone says intersectionality, it's like, it's sort of like, you know, you have to like value people as their whole selves and not just like sort of like slices of themselves. Um, for me, intersectionality means that whenever anyone asks me any given question, if they, some people say, as a woman, like, how is it in tech? But for me, it's not just that I am a woman in tech. It's that I am a black pansexual woman in tech. Like, there's so many other things that would go into feeding my answer that I can't just pick out and pull out the womanness of me and be like, this is it. That's just a very hard thing to ask someone to do. And I feel like if a lot of spaces and people kind of say, in this space, you're going to be a black person. So talk about life as a black person. And it's like, yeah, there's like so many other things that go into that. So intersectionality just means that no matter where I am or what I'm doing, I am my whole self. And you can't ask me to just pick out a piece of myself. I will always be true to myself. <laughs> awesome. Um, so 
It feels like a lot of discussions about diversity in tech focus on, uh, almost solely on hiring, uh, and that's like not like all of uh, you know that's that's so not entirely the issue. Um, people kind of leave uh, at all points of the process. You know, it's not just hiring, but also retention and also promotion of, of people who uh, come from all kinds of, of different backgrounds. Um, could you guys? Um, uh, Maybe shed some light on on uh, some of the reasons why you think that that retention is a problem, in uh, light of those things. Um, yeah, like, so I, um, I didn't. I'm not like an expert. <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert. I just, I just, I, just, I just have my lived experience as sort of like examples. But um, for me, like. Uh, you can't have diversity without like inclusion. They go hand in hand. So like, I like I am I am of multiple marginalized identities, and I work in a, an environment where it's like mostly straight white cis men. Um, I mean, I'm it's like the majority of the people I work with in engineering, and um, and I feel like I definitely feel that like I am. An, an other person, and um, I feel like uh, this environment can do like a way better job of making people feel included, safe, valued, and and respected for my identity. And um, so I feel like there's a lot of work that can be done, and I can see like why retention is a problem um, for marginalized people because we just don't we don't recognize or like. The environment, the type of environment I work in, like we, they don't re recognize these identities, um, and so, like I think you have to have a culture of inclusion, sort of like weaved into this the tech culture, um, and like I can just sort of so like in in the in my engineering team, like we have no uh, black people, for example, like, and I kind of like dread the day that we hire like the one black <laughs> engineer. Um, cuz i'm going to feel so bad for them like they're going to feel so like tokenized and i don't know like we need to work at figuring out how to like make them feel welcome you know or, like make them feel included and not like stick out like a sore, th sore thumb you know yeah um at least in my experience i've heard i think there's an, for at least with retention there's an issue with education so of the people who need to um, make others feel welcome. So at least in my experience, I was um, I was awarded a scholarship for the college I ultimately dropped out of. And with getting that scholarship, they said it was completely merit-based, but then once you get there and you're like, oh my god, like I'm the only like black person, let alone a girl. And then everyone kind of says, um, not to your face, but kind of around you that, oh, you were hired to fill a quota or like this scholarship was, you kind of got it because you're a black and a girl, so hey, like just acknowledge that fact. But then later on in life, I was talking with my boss who said that I, I knew that he truly didn't mean it, but whenever someone who is a minority is in his interview room, he questions them harder because he knows that, at least for his school, that they didn't really actually base it on merits for some of the students who got certain scholarships. And so there's this kind of um, lack of sharing of stories where on both sides, you're, you're basically getting screwed because you may get the scholarship purely on merits, but then later on in the flow of this, this system, people assume that you didn't get based on merits and they push you harder. And if you fail these harder tests, then you leave. And I ultimately ended up dropping out because I'm like, this place isn't for me. And along the flow, they did not make me feel welcome. And so I think that if somehow we could like inject it into everyone's minds how to communicate and how to, um, from the start of a process, find the best people, um, that would be amazing. 
Um, so in light of um, all of these problems, uh, one thing that's really important is that you practice active self-care uh, and not let yourself be, be bogged down or, or worn down or burned out by any of these things. Uh, can you give some examples of like how you practice self-care in an environment that can often be toxic? Yeah, well, um, so I, I have a good like base of sort of like friends, <laughs> so like, when I'm not, I mean, when I, when I, yeah, so I do experience some sort of like incidents at work and I, and I don't have many like allies to like, I, I, or I feel comfortable like talking to about these. I could just like go back home and then just talk to my friends about it. And um, so I feel like it's pretty important to have like a good sort of group of friends that you can um, go back home to like basically vent to tell these stories to and then they'll basically validate your experience um, I don't know that's sort of how I deal with it um, yeah so like yeah for I with the experience I just shared um, that was a bad time for me and you at least personally, I had to acknowledge to myself that I needed outside help. I needed to find and talk to someone, and I ended up actually like going to mental health professionals. Um, so that in itself has another whole set of stigmas that come along with it. So you'll have to add that to your marginalized identity list. But it was the best experience, and even though I still don't have my degree, I am ultimately a better person, I have moved on from like that dark time. And so I think that finding someone and acknowledging in yourself that yes, I need help is one of the best things you can do. Don't think that you can fight alone by yourself because that could lead to a bad situation. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up. That's a, a really important point. I think uh, mental health issues affect uh, a lot of different people in the, the tech community. It's a, a really competitive space in a lot of ways. Um, and it, it encourages people to feel inadequate uh, and the, uh, sometimes kind of alone in the things that they're feeling. And the, the truth is, a lot of different people of, of marginalized and of com not marginalized identities experience those things uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, and so being able to talk about that openly, I think, is, is something important that uh, probably should happen a little bit more in this community. Um, so uh, maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about, um, uh, I really like what you brought up um, uh, about kind of having a, a community of, of people. Um, maybe uh, if you can't find them inside your work, you can find them outside. Uh, how did you, did you, did you find this, this community? Did you make it yourself? How did you? Uh, kind of, kind of uh, uh, get that for yourself. Um, I guess it like sort of started maybe like four years ago. I, I was like, I was like a pretty ignorant like yuppie living in San Francisco. Uh, I was one of those shuttle bus type people, um, and I, uh, I didn't know what was going on like in terms of societal problems or social issues. Um, and then like I, I and then I dated someone who was like who was politicized and like basically opened my mind to like the ignorance to uh, anyway um, and uh, and then I slowly just sort of started getting to know other um, queer uh, um, um, Asian and Pacific Islander women and trans people uh, and um, so like my sort of this this um, community, I uh, I started like building this sort of community of friends and uh, who like sort of are more, are like like minded and uh, share the same types of values as me. Um, so yeah, that kind of came about over like a couple of years, um, and so uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I, I think um, it's important uh, to try and, and reach out actively to, to find other people who uh, uh, 
you can you can identify with and who can help validate your your feelings. Um, and that's one of the the I think the best ways to uh, react to a situation where you sometimes feel uh, alone. And and kind of similar to that. Uh, Something else that can be really, really helpful and, and powerful for you career-wise and personally is uh, finding a, a great mentor, somebody that you look up to, you know, whether that's someone who's older than you or maybe younger than you, uh, someone who you can really ad ad admire and learn a lot from. Do um, you guys have experiences with uh, finding someone like that? Well, I... <laughs> so, um, yeah, like this past February, um, there was a summit called Lesbians Who Tech Summit in San Francisco, um, and I attended. I luck, like fortunately, like m someone at work was like, "Hey, there's this opportunity. We have like one ticket left to this Lesbians Who Tech thing." And then I like jumped at the the ticket. And anyway, so I got to go, and there was this one talk given by someone named Dom de, de Guzman of uh, Twilio. She's uh, an engineer at Twilio, and um, she gave this talk called Breaking the Bro Code, and I was like totally inspired by her. She was, she's like exactly like me, queer, like Asian woman in a sort of like DevOps engineering type role at a company in San Francisco. And she uh, basically started, or she like co started this roundtable discussion group after someone sent a, like a sort of problematic email, and it sort of turned into this sort of flame war type email thread and uh, and then sort of a, a, a like discussion group formed out of that and they met weekly it started growing and in turn it turned into like the diversity and inclusion sort of initiative at Twilio and then it sort of became this whole sort of company wide like initiative um, and so I'm like and, and she started the queer group at her company and I'm like whoa it's totally awesome I want to be exactly like her and so now, like, uh, I, I kind of just like want to follow in her footsteps, even though she's like a whole decade younger than me. <laughs> um, in terms of finding mentors, uh, I have a few friends who are like pretty awesome at all of this stuff that they're doing. Um, one of them is Sam Brenton. If any of you have not looked him up, you should do that. Um, she is the best person. Um, Sam is Sam is genderqueer, so whenever I speak to him, he kind of just lets me fluidly change whatever pronoun I wish to use. Um, and so, if you hear me mixing them up, it's totally just something I've gotten used to. Um, but she she's someone who I've been interacting with for a while, and we have attended a few like conferences together. And for me, at least finding mentors has always happened in a conference space. Um, I find it's the best way to find like-minded people who are interested in what you're interested in, because, well, most of the time they pay to be here. They probably are interested in whatever is happening. And I think that in spaces like these, like net networking and meeting other people, because at the moment, they might start off as your peer, but like two, three years down the line, you're like, you have done amazing things. Teach me all that you have done. I want to be you. <laughs> cool. So um, uh, I like what you brought up there about like the, the diversity and affinity and employee resource groups uh, that, that sometimes companies have. Um, Maybe you could talk a little bit about about that and how that's worked for you, and and um, other like really concrete things that organizations have done to make you feel like not only that you uh, can be comfortable there, but that you can really succeed. Uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, so I. Ah, there's so much I want to say. <laughs> Where do I begin? So. Um, I don't know, somewhere, sometime earlier this year, my company, or like HR at my company, um, had like a sexual harassment training or something. Um, and so, so like, we talked a lot about what is harassment, what is discrimination, what, do, what does it look like, what are, what's microaggressions and stuff like that. And uh, we had like a, we had an exercise to do afterward, and one of the exercises was do something 
take some kind of action, basically. Or we had actually a choice of three different things. One, two were like read these two articles, or like make a suggestion that you can where you can actually like create change. And so my suggestion was get rid of the gender segregated restrooms in the office because we had men and women and uh, we had no gender neutral restrooms. And so my suggestion was either turn them all into gender inclusive restrooms, which was shot down, or have like, you know, single stall gender neutral restrooms. And then so um, they actually like, were like, hey, let's actually just do that. And so that it's actually like happening. And I'm like, whoa, that's cool. I can actually like create this kind of change. Whoa. Um, and, um, and then I also got really inspired uh, to just sort of start uh, a diversity initiative and to start a queer group at my office. And, um, and so I, I just, uh, it, it was kind of like slow going at first because I had this sort of grand big picture idea of like what it would look like and I had no idea how to start. I didn't have any like allies and I didn't know what was going on. But um, we had this like sort of, uh, uh, sort of, we had this thing called a notes day at, at my, in the engineering team at least, and at my company. And um, it was inspired by uh, something that Pixar does. Um, and it came from a book that one of the Pixar people wrote called Creative Inc. Basically, it was like a whole like offsite day um, where we spent a whole day talking about topics that we wouldn't normally talk about in the in the office environment. So one of them was like diversity. We had just never talked about diversity, and so we spent a good day just talking about it. And it turns out a lot of people care about diversity, which I, I was like completely surprised about. I, I thought I was like the only person in the office who like cared about it. But yeah, it turned into this whole sort of movement. And it sort of snowballed into this thing, and it motivated me to actually like start the queer group, which I did. And we had our first meeting like a couple weeks ago, and we're already like getting T-shirts. We're getting like literally 200 <laughs> T-shirts printed up <laughs> as we speak. Uh, tomorrow we're having a, a Pride happy hour because like uh, Pride SF Pride is like this weekend, um, so it's to kick that off. And there's like all these things already happening, and I'm like, wow. That's cool. I didn't know anyone would be interested. Anyway, so yeah, that that's kind of my story. Uh, yeah, no, if you have uh, some examples of like concrete things that, that organizations have done. Um, so at least at OK Cupid, because our job is helping other people meet other people for various reasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, we, we span the spectrum, but our, our office conversations kind of um, range on the more liberal free side because we need to be able to discuss all of the different types of people who might be using our site and how to best help them and make them feel included. So um, at our office, we had very, very many discussions because we launched um, non-binary support. So you can have, I believe, up to five different genders that you may choose from and up to five different um, orientations that you may choose from. And in the discussion of this, we had to decide, well, do how do people find you? What is OK? Like, what isn't OK? And so it at least. Um, at least for my office, for OK Keep It, they made you feel welcome to say whatever things you needed to say, either in the public space or by emailing the project manager, because ultimately it affects our bottom line if you think something is offensive. Um, and so during any meetings, if you think that we have done the wrong thing, then you speak up about it, because for a site helping other people meet other people, we don't want to offend anyone because, well, we're going to lose customers. Like, it wouldn't work out. So I think that if your company starts with this ingrained, I think you mentioned that, yes, if your company starts with the idea of including other people ingrained in it, then as you grow and as it becomes stronger, it's better in the long run. Cool. So <clears throat> we have a lot more questions. We can keep talking just ourselves. But uh, yeah, if anybody has any um, 
commentary or things, experiences like they, they'd like to share, um, questions relevant to things that we talked about, uh, anything like that. I'm currently working on a resource called Open Source for Women, mm -hmm. um, which is intended to connect women with welcoming projects, women running projects, projects with codes of conduct, and also help women find pair partners that they can go after open source issues or projects with. Um, in light of the multifaceted nature, the intersectional nature of a lot of people's identity, does anyone have suggestions for language that would be a signal that the community is welcoming to anyone who identifies as a woman? Um, I can't remember where I saw this, but I saw something that said, um, welcome to all women, no matter your journey to getting here. Um, and I was like, that's so amazing. <laughs> this is perfect, because it doesn't, yeah. um, like all of us have probably seen welcome to woman and trans woman, and that isn't, no. <laughs> Please don't do that. No one do that. Um, and so, yeah, and so at least if you just say whatever your journey to getting here, it also includes many other different um, minority statuses people can have, and they can apply it to themselves in their own way. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, I know you mentioned that if a system were to be designed with diversity in mind from the onset, yeah. then it is more inclined to be diverse. Mm -hmm. um, so I just came from, I ran in the Wikimedia Foundation board election this year, mm -hmm. um, and we like to think that the system that we've built is inherently designed for diversity. Um, but we apparently have just realized that in this election, and I was talking to our leader earlier, um, this election produced basically three white men who won in the election. So the thing there is that how do you, um, and also there's also, you know, greater issues of diversity. We're not as diverse as we think we are. So I guess the issue there is in any community, how would you deal with um, ensuring that trying to figure out the right way to phrase it. It's like, um, have there been instances in other communities, first of all, that where you are designed for diversity, but you've not gotten the results that you wanted, wherein you are actually less diverse than you appear? And then the second question there is that, even if you have the systems in place, how could you make sure that um, you can still maintain a diverse community and prevent you know, regressing towards the, the mainstream, if you will? Second part, uh, the second part of my question is kind of referred to uh, specifically mm -hmm. 
um, when you're sort of faced with that situation where they believe you only got there because of like uh, a higher check of box, yeah. why is the response not to just be better or not, but to show them why you got hired? Um, so to answer your first question, I think that it's kind of, for me at least, it's personally nice to find a mentor who is something like me because then I know that it's actually possible. But if anybody did whatsoever, then it's clearly possible. If it's possible for them, but it, I think it's, it's possible for you. Like, for me at least, it's meeting those people. Like I might have in my mind that there might be a black woman, black queer woman out there who has achieved it, but for me at least, I'm a seeing is believing type person. And so if I can like meet this woman and if I can talk to her and if I can ask her experiences, it, I, I would find that greatly helpful. Um, and to answer your second question, as when, when this was mentioned to me um, with being, well, basically hired for the quota, um, it's hard to consistently do better and still feel, uh, so I, I would, I'm going to say, I, I was suffered with depression because I consistently tried to be better so much to prove these people wrong. And in that moment, when you get a C, you feel like if you've completely failed because they will look at that and you think they'll judge you and I would spiral. And so I think that a system where you're not pushed to be better just to make the company better or to better yourself, but a push to be better to prove other people wrong is the wrong reason to do it. I would push to be better for myself, but to strive to suddenly become the best programmer is something that I know personally that I'm, I'm not going to achieve that. But I want to strive to become the best programmer for myself. And I don't want to become the best programmer for them. Because the issue with that is at one company, they might say, oh, hey, it'd be really good if you knew all of these algorithms and stuff. So I'd be like, fine, I can do that. But if I move to another company and they want a different other set of skills, I've pushed myself to become something amazing in the eyes of this one group of people, but I haven't made myself happy. And if I'm not making myself happy, then it, it hasn't been worth it. Hmm? No. Okay. I guess um, now that we're talking about employment, <laughs> I'm very, um, actually, some people at this conference know this, but just so I, I could disclose, um, I was let go for culture fit reasons. And I have felt that the reason why I was let go for, cult, um, officially the reason was they said I was intimidating, slightly intimidating. The unofficial reason I felt was because I wasn't like them. Because, um, and I don't know how this works in the United States. Um, I was employed by a company in Singapore. And everybody, before I came in, everybody was either Singaporean or Malaysian. Um, and you know, they say Singaporeans and Malaysians are alike. So I guess the thing there is that if something were to be, um, I don't know if it has happened that um, diversity is, um, or rather diversity suffers because of um, this, all this talk about having to build a corporate culture where everybody can work together, or where diversity, um, as a diversity that comes about because of a corporate culture ends up suffering because we can't um, uh, suppress that human impulse to uh, be the, uh, a microaggressor against somebody simply because I just don't like that person. Um, I guess I could talk about a little, a little bit about cultural fit at my company. Oh, um, at least if on your point of uh, corporate culture, mm -hmm. I feel like if people misuse that as a way of being um, exclusionary towards other people. Mm -hmm. For me, the ideal corporate culture, if there is a thing, is one that says our culture is to be welcoming, our culture is to be accepting. Like, not our culture is to be, you wear like shorts on this day and blue shirts on this day. Like, no, no, that shouldn't be the culture. Um, it shouldn't be defined by what people look like, what they dress, what they do on their weekends. The culture should be, we are accepting of you in all the ways you represent yourself. And when we take our company photo, you can be who you are in all the various ways 
you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, just like at my own, at my company, we have, well, at least I think hopefully we've taken it out, but culture fit is like one of the like quali quali qualifications or like a pre prerequisite to like getting hired. Mm -hmm. And actually a lot of tech companies have this cultural fit wording in, in their hiring practices, which is just wrong because it's it's really easy to use that to like you to like unconsciously discriminate against people um, because of, of the race, gender, what have you. Um, and so we've actively or we're actively trying to get rid of that basically. And I mean, just uh, sorry, um, diversity has is just known. I mean, there's been studies like over and over that di diversity helps a company in terms of like innovation and even like. Profit. I mean, profit goes up when there's more diversity. There's charts kind of like that. You know? <laughs> so so I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your your experience. Though. Uh, okay. So uh, to kind of follow on that real quick. So I. I you can totally see a lot of the issues and challenges of yeah. that, that having like a fuzzy culture fit uh, phase of interviewing uh, introduces in respect to diversity and a whole bunch of other things. On the other hand, at least a lot of the ways where, we, where we're currently even, we, that's also a proxy for like, is it gonna make everybody miserable to spend eight hours a day with this person, right? Like, to, to like, because there are still moments of like, nobody wants to work with somebody who's clearly a jerk, right? Like. In perspective of why they're a jerk, but just you know, want to be jerks. Uh, so, do you have thoughts, or, or have, have you guys started to work through like how you still manage that? If that makes sense. Yeah. So, like for example, you brought up a jerk example. Like, if 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 the problem is they might be a jerk, so you should just clearly state, don't hire jerks, and not just like, are they right. cultural fit? Because that because cultural fit is so vague. I mean, like, so you should ex be more explicit. Don't just say culture fits. Say, don't, let's not hire jerks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think um, maybe something that goes along with that is, is thinking about it in terms of uh, values than, than about culture. So if one of the really important values to your company is that the employees respect and trust each other, and someone is just being like a total asshole, that's violating the, uh, the value of respect and trust. Whereas, where somebody who might uh, communicate differently or, or something like that, where it's they might be culturally different, but but still sharing the values, uh, you, I think that person would pass the, the that test, whereas a, a jerk wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> company doesn't necessarily understand that there is an issue, um, and that sometimes the issue can go as far as um, not recognizing, not acknowledging the diversity of their clients, and then employees feel like they can't be themselves, you know, if the company isn't even recognizing the identities of their clients, then they feel like they can't be themselves, and so they're not going to speak up. And so um, if a company, one thing that I found really helpful was convincing the company to acknowledge customers, because that's a very direct profit. <laughs> um, and then that has a, it wasn't ideal, but it was at least a trickle down effect to employees feeling like, oh good, we at least have this thing. And my company, the original reaction was, oh, people know we're friendly. Um, they don't actually. Um, you you kind of need to let the community know that you are accepting of, of different identities. So that was something that was interesting to me, was just the at least very basic education of um, you may not know there's an issue. Yeah, and that, that's a, a, another good thing to bring up, um, an idea that I've heard floating around a lot lately, um, is the idea of explicit invitations. You know, don't, like, don't make people guess whether or not you're, you're, you're friendly and welcoming uh, and inclusive for some types of, of things. Make it, make it really clear if that is something that you support that you, know, that you do. And that you you especially that you want women and people of color and, and uh, people of various minority statuses to to apply and, and to become involved. 
Um, so this is also um, uh, in response to something that we said in some odd comments ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I know in terms of uh, people who I look for in terms of making a choice, um, I'm also a black trans person. Um, and I grew up in Portland, uh, which, which as I'm sure you can see looking out the window, is very white. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's white. Um, I was, I can count on probably one hand how many black people I've been, like, have seen on a regular basis, like, K through 12. I can definitely count on one hand the number of black people in my class in college. Um, and so, uh, um, but so, uh, for me, uh, having mentors or people that I can look up to who are people of color, who are trans, um, people who have like depressions or people who deal with mental health stuff, like, that's really useful because, like, yes, those people exist in the packet and, like, I know that they do, but it means something different when I can actually talk to them. Like, it means something different when I can use them as a sounding board, and, or they can use me as a sounding board. Like, that relationship is something that's very different than just reading about it on the internet or in a book. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of people in in Rich Cut's story, I'm afraid that everyone's going to be the first one. Mm -hmm. That there may not be that many mentors in your circle. You may have to be the first one. You may have to pick an old white guy like me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I personally love that aspect, and I. I like to be there just because I am the graybeard. I've gone through a lot of that stuff. <laughs> Certainly not the same kind of experiences, um, and I won't even pretend to, but I can certainly help out in whatever way I can. Um, but I certainly understand I'd be the lowest pick on the board. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess the question is what could I do to kind of help out? Um. I want to say that um, at least like being here and saying that makes it clear. For me, I have this fear of approaching someone and being like, hey, you know, I am a minority in this case. I'm going to pick you to mentor me and not knowing how you will react and what your response to that will be. Um, so I think that just go to a lot of conferences, <laughs> talk to a lot of people, and because at least for now, all of us in the room, if someone comes to us and says, like, I need a mentor, we can be like, we know. Just <laughs> um, oh. a comment on that. I mentor a lot of mentors where I'm from. <laughs> um, so I just thought, well, I met them. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's really important to remember that there's a difference between mentorship and coaching and sponsoring somebody and the sort of relationship and the kind of conversations you can have in those relationships. Sure, 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 um, sure, sure. And so I also, weirdly enough, mentor the protégés on how to be good protégés as well. So <laughs> from everywhere. That's what I like. But, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, and I imagine this depends a lot on the size of the company that you're working in, but if you see uh, usefulness for forming like intersectional space, safe spaces, so like women of color group or queer and trans group or things like that, like within the company, um, either on company time or not on company time, but like has that been useful or are, are more sort of like intercompany like like lesbian do tech conference or things like that more useful than finding those kind of space or making those kind of spaces at your company. So was the question like is it helpful? Is that the question? Is it helpful to have those types of spaces? Yeah, well I make it um, helpful. Well, so like I, the, the queer and ally group at my company literally like just started. We had like one meeting so far and I think so I mean, like we haven't really done much yet, um, but I do find it helpful just because, like, I know, I know that I'm not the only queer person at, at my company. That's like maybe like there's like maybe 500 of us at our company. Um, so I know that if you know if I am queer and I am feeling this way, there's a good chance that other people are also feeling this way. 
and I and just to like be able to validate each other's feelings, that's like extremely invaluable. Like just to have that um, that support there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so it's three fifteen. So if anybody needs to to leave for anything like that, uh, we, I think we'd be happy to continue talking about any of this if people want to continue. But feel free to leave if you need to. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you.